think m- many Christians who read someone like C.S. Lewis or read uh, an author like J.R. Tolkien really appreciate the, the observation that, that Tolkien himself makes, and, and Lewis certainly affirmed, that if we are made in, in the image of God and God himself is a creator, then it follows that human beings are, as Tolkien puts it, sub-creators. The way that we image God, the way that we pattern God, the way that we imitate him and participate in his life-creating activity is to be artists, to be makers. And um, even in the creed, we speak about uh, God as the maker of heaven and earth. And, and the verb there is, is connected the, to the verb for poetry in Greek. It's, um, it's a sense in which mankind is made to be a poetic creature. They're fundamentally making creatures or artistic creatures. I, I myself am not a, a practicing artist in any particular uh, medium, but Tolkien's insight is that human beings, just by virtue of being human beings, echoing and imaging God, are called to create. They're, they're made to create. And that may take the form of typical... Um, artistic manifestations in painting or music or poetry uh, or the visual arts. It may also take other forms uh, such as architecture or or woodworking and carving. It may take um, other forms in in, in Lewis's case, say, of the artistry of words, uh, what his Lewis's father called the sweet witchery of words um, that calls to us like the murmur beneath the sea. And so that capacity to shape and, and to form and to sculpt words was very much the artistry that Lewis and Tolkien were engaged in. So many, so many beautiful artists have, have, have noticed that when Adam is formed and Eve are, are, is with him as a companion, a, both sub-creators within the garden, Adam is first called to, to name the, the animals. And his first vocation, so to speak, is, is to be that of a poet, to rightly name and to see into the essence of that which God has created and provided for him, and to articulate um, through his own verbal creation what is it that God has made, to magnify the praise of the creation through his own language and the rightful naming of the animals. And then when he perceives Eve, um, God's next creation and companion for him, Adam slips into, even in the, in the very language of the scriptures itself, Adam slips into poetry. And so he, he breaks forth into song because not even a name would suffice. He says, here at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. The, the only thing that Adam can do when presented with the glory of the, the first female is to burst into song. And I'm sure... Many young men, when they've fallen into their first love, have much the same experience. They want to write, they want to create, they want to sing. It's part of our nature to, to be artists and, and to practice that art. What's, what's amazing about the Orthodox Church is just the, the, the scope and the scale that it gives for artists to express that. When my wife and I visited Moscow in 2015, one, one of the most beautiful aspects about the resurgence of church life within Russia, uh, in the places that we visited, be it Moscow or uh, the St. Sergius Lavra and elsewhere, was that it seemed that all the best artists were doing the work in the church. And it, perhaps we don't always get that feel in America where you'll, you'll be lucky if you get an artist in your, in your community and you'll be lucky if you get a good artist in your community. But the best visual artists, the best people dealing with tapestries, the best uh, restorers of, of icon, icons and of fabrics, the best silversmiths were, were making the chalices and the chandeliers and, and the lampadki. All of this was, was taken for granted within the Russian culture that if, if this is something's going to be done to the glory of God, it has to be the absolute best. And so it drew the best artists into the church because they were able to express it in the architecture of the buildings, in the adornments and um, furnishings of the buildings. And so it created that, that whole atmosphere of this place is paradise because it is so saturated with beauty. And, and that's just what, you know, that's just what Adam and Eve experienced. Their, their paradise or, or, you know, what, what the Greek tradition, the Hebrew tradition know as a walled garden, 
a, a place of intense cultivation and intense beauty um, allows the person to step into that beauty and to be refreshed in soul. And not only are we made in, by nature to image in our creative activities, we also have a fundamental thirst for beauty and a fundamental hunger for beauty that has to be satisfied. Aristotle, when he was describing what it is to be human, said that by nature, all men desire knowledge in, in the sense that we have a, a native intellectual appetite that unless we're educated and unless we're provided with the food of learning, we find our souls wither. And I, I think we could add to that, by nature, our souls desire beauty and they seek beauty and yearn to be fed upon beauty. Even within Moscow of 2015, when my wife and I would be going through the streets, the city still wears, you know, predominantly a, a you know, Soviet dress. And all the buildings are hard and cruel and Soviet brutalist modernism. Uh, or as Tolkien would say, evil is dull, vain, and repetitive. But when you would step off the streets and you'd, you'd go into the monastery that was being restored, all of a sudden you stepped into that walled garden and your, your soul was just refreshed by the beauty and the peace and the calm uh, that the Christian church or the Christian monastery could provide as a, as a haven and an oasis within this world from the surrounding modernist, crude capitalist culture that was just producing junk and, and really ugly stuff. So the church gives that to, to feed our souls, and, and we need that. Lewis, again, in his sermon, The Weight of Glory, puts it admirably when he says, our, our souls do not really, merely wish to behold the beautiful. We wish to be united with the beautiful. We want to bathe in it, to be immersed in it. Um, to use more theological language, we, we wish to be united or co-joined, to commune with beauty itself, capital B, not merely to, to view it from afar but to be joined to it and to become beautiful oneself. And that, um, that thirst for beauty, which is, which is natively human, yeah, no, the, the, soul, the soul wishes to be beautiful. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's a deep thirst uh, within the human soul. And only the church can, can satisfy that. Only the church can give in the beautiful chalice, in the beautiful church, the food and the fruit which will transform the human person to make them beautiful again, to restore them uh, into the image and likeness of God. So it's, um, it's a challenge and it's a prospect for the church, but it's also the gift of the church and something that um, the church offers to the world and a world that has been deformed and uglified and desecrated. It's, it's not by accident that the, the word for beautiful in Latin is forma. We wish to be reformed, to be informed, to be forma once again, to be beautiful once again. And we as Orthodox, I think, could very much share uh, the ancient Greek insight that if um, Plato says, if we were to see reason, the form of reason itself, we would be captivated by her beauty. The forms themselves are enchanting. The things that God has made are enchanting, and uh, perhaps we, uh, we reflect that in, in the very mode of how we operate within the church, that you know, predominantly most of our services are done, done by chant. That song is meant to take us into a, a realm of beauty, to lift us up, and to let us down changed. So there, there's, uh, there's so much to say on the subject.